Hello, my name is Bruce Strober, and I'm the Secretary Treasurer of the International Psoriasis Council. I am a clinical professor of dermatology at Yale University, and I practice at Central Connecticut Dermatology. I'm here with my colleague, Dr. Andy Blaldo. Hi, Bruce. I'm happy to join you today. My name is Andy Blavelt. I'm a dermatologist and president of the Oregon Medical Research Center, which is a private clinical trial center in Portland, Oregon. So Andy and I were part of a great effort that was initiated over a year ago. The idea was to redefine the severity classifications used for psoriasis. Basically, it was, uh, it was basically driven by a dissatisfaction with how we grade severity in psoriasis patients, namely the concept of mild, moderate, and severe. We didn't want to embark on a biased personal opinion approach to how to do this. So we used what is called a Delphi process, which allows anonymous contributions from experts and other stakeholders to help identify answers to questions that aren't easily answered by the literature, by peer reviewed studies. So the IPC organized itself around a complex Delphi process, which we'll go into later. And the output was quite informative with regard to redefining how we think about psoriasis patients in a completely different manner, not using grades like mild, moderate to severe, but using the concept of whether patients do well on topical therapies or have special areas of the body affected. So Andy and I will go through a discussion now over the next several minutes to help explain uh, a little bit about severity of psoriasis, what um, are the current tools to explore severity. We'll then get into the process we used for the Delphi and then finally discuss the implications and effects that this output has on not only uh, psoriasis treatment providers, but also people with psoriasis and how we think ultimately patients will benefit from this endeavor. So the first thing we should talk about is how is the severity of psoriasis categorized, not only in clinical trials, but also in practice. Andy, tell me a little bit about that issue. Well, as you mentioned in the intro, um, this is an area that um, we've been practicing in for many, many years um, with tools that have problems, um, especially when, we, when it gets down to the patient level. So the current tools that many of you may be familiar with um, include objective tools and subjective tools. And if we look at the objective tools first, we see the most commonly used one is the body surface area involved. So we call that the BSA, um, fairly straightforward. Um, we can tell how much of the psoriasis uh, affects the body. Um, many of us use the palm method or the hand method um, to, uh, to assess that 1% of the body is equal to about one handprint. Um, and so that's a typical way in clinical practice and in clinical trials. If we go um, another step further, we see the physician's global assessment. Um, this is, uh, as, as, it, uh, as it's named, is a global assessment of psoriasis severity. So this is considering all the lesions on the body um, and then coming up with a categorization that's usually a five point categorization of clear skin as a zero, almost clear skin as a one, um, two, being mild psoriasis, three, moderate, and four, severe. Um, fairly straightforward, it's a gestalt, it's walking in the room, um, looking at the character of the lesions and saying, uh, this patient has mild versus severe. Um, and then the third main objective measure is, is, a, is a feature, is a, a tool that we call the PASI, the Psoriasis Area Severity Index. Um, this was developed in the late 1970s. It's a validated uh, measurement tool for assessing psoriasis severity. We see it commonly in clinical trials, but not so commonly used in clinical practice. And as the name implies, the PASI has area and severity um, as components to the score. Uh, the score ranges from zero to 72. Um, so essentially you assess 
um, the signs of psoriasis, which include erythema, in duration and scale, and judge those three signs um, within four regions of the body, the head and neck, the upper extremities, the trunk, and the lower extremities. So probably the PASI um, is the most extensive, the most detailed one, probably the most difficult to one. Um, we don't see it used much in uh, private practice in the US. It's more commonly used in Europe. And then if we look at the subjective um, scoring systems for psoriasis. This is where we ask the patient, um, how is psoriasis impacting your life? And probably the, there's a number of these, but the one that we uh, tend to focus on the most and the one we have the most experience is the Dermatology Life Quality Index, or DLQI for short. And this is a series of questions asking about how psoriasis um, or skin disease in general affects the quality of life of individuals. So a variety of questions, you come up with a score. There's different categorizations of the scoring system. Um, for example, if, if the score is zero or one, the DOQI means that there's um, no impact of the skin disease on quality of life. And two to six is, is a mild impact and, and so forth. So these are the main tools, three main objective tools and one main subjective tool used to assess psoriasis severity. So how could the objective measurements that you described like BSA, PGA, POSI underestimate disease severity, um, especially in, in patients with past treatment failures or maybe more limited disease? Right, so there are problems with all, all of these assessments. Um, and um, what we see, for example, for BSA, if we simply look at just the body surface area, um, what we're not taking into account at all is whether the lesions are thin or thick or mild lesions versus very severe lesions. So that's one of the main problems of BSA. So for example, you could have a few lesions, a very low BSA, um, but the lesions could be very thick very crusty, um, cause lots of impact and quality of life. Or you could have the opposite, kind of widespread lesions that are relatively thin, maybe most of them may be clear, um, and therefore um, the BSA would not tell the whole story. Um, the, the thing that is not captured, not captured well at all, is the particular locations of the lesions. We think of psoriasis, oh my gosh, you know, we, we have, we have the scalp being a particularly tough area for us, uh, hard to treat topically. Uh, we all have seen severe scalp psoriasis patients, but if you just apply those tools, um, the, the entire scalp surface is about 4% of the body surface area. So if a patient with severe scalp psoriasis, for example, um, was, was, had failed topical therapies and struggling and have a big impact on their quality of life, they actually wouldn't qualify for a biologic or systemic therapy in many cases because um, they don't, don't reach that commonly referred to 10% BSA as the threshold used by many insurance companies as well as many um, clinical trial enrollments. So it, it's, it's clear, as you say, limited BSA, for example, 4% could involve a large part of the scalp um, and be resistant to topical therapies and or maybe a, a couple plaques that are on the lower extremities that are highly itchy, highly pyritic, and really not touched by topical therapies. Um, these patients um, would not get into clinical trials yet could have a tremendous impact on their quality of life. Yeah, it is really a tough situation if you come down to human beings in your office. And I think many of us, I think this is, this is essentially why we've, we undertook this effort because many of us have those patients, right? Where, where they've used multiple topicals on the scalp, multiple shampoos, um, and really what they need is systemic therapy. They need a good biologic, and yet they don't come close to re meeting that criteria. Or in the case that you mentioned, uh, the shins. Um, I have uh, female patients um, who like to have uh, clear legs, um, not, not surprising. And um, they, they might have resistant plaques there and yet be clear everywhere else and yet have a huge impact on their quality of life. 
be very frustrated um, by giving uh, topical steroids over and over again, maybe some other topical therapies and still be struggling mightily with their disease. So in, in a nutshell, uh, we can see how uh, current severity classifications, including the need to be 10% or more, could deny patients appropriate therapies um, and leave them stuck because many providers wouldn't go to the next step in patients who we are discussing right now. And this, again, underscores the need, in our opinion, to redefine patients who are appropriate for systemic therapy or phototherapy um, and go beyond simple topical churn, as we like to call it, one topical to the next, uh, ever uh, increasing the potency of topicals, which often gets nowhere um, and leaves patients frustrated, ultimately uh, disenchanted. It may even lead to a lot of patients um, leaving the dermatology world and le being left alone uh, with no treatment at all without getting care in, in perpetuity. Yeah, I have to say also, um, think about BSA, Bruce. I mean, it is, it's such an artificial number, right? To say 10% is some magical number. Um, and so we have patients with 6%, 7%, 8%, 9% or disease on the scalp or in bad places. It doesn't make any common sense to tell that patient to their face, oh, we have these terrific drugs for psoriasis, but you can't get one, I'm sorry. Um, you don't quite have enough body surface area. So it doesn't make any common sense at all. Um, that type of patient, it, it's really the, uh, are very needy. And um, that, those are the types of patients that we were thinking about, I think, when we were doing this exercise. So as you'll learn, part of our new criteria defining severity involves the concept of special areas. So Andy, what are the special areas in detail? Well, it's a good question. Um, and we did talk about scalp a little bit, but we can think of the special areas as areas of the body that um, are particularly tough either to treat or that have a, a, a disproportionate amount of impact on the quality of life of a patient. So um, the areas would include scalp, um, the palms and soles, Obviously, um, with limited BSA, if you have palm and sole involvement, you're going to have a big impact on quality of life. It's poorly responsive to topical therapy. Nail disease, um, we all know that that's poorly responsive to topical therapy. Um, doesn't necessarily mean that there's high BSA when we see psoriatic nail disease. Um, genital psoriasis. Genital psoriasis can sometimes only be located in that area can be particularly difficult to treat topically um, and have a big impact on quality of life. So scalp, nails, genitals, uh, palms and soles. And then lastly, um, there may be patients in our practices that have relatively little BSA, not involving those special areas. Let's say they have elbow and knee psoriasis where they have psoriatic arthritis. And um, that is a particular patient, um, especially a more moderate to severe psoriatic arthritis, where they definitely would be a candidate for systemic therapy. And a lot of those patients are in our offices. So not just where the psoriasis is, but do they have psoriatic arthritis as well? Yeah, I think that's an excellent discussion. One last question. What do you think about inverse psoriasis? Yeah, I didn't mention that. Um, I think many people do put that in a special area. Um, it can be difficult to treat topically. It can definitely be, uh, have a, a disproportionate amount of uh, impact on quality of life, especially, especially in the inguinal area, under the breast, uh, axilla. Um, yeah, I, I do think that um, that can also be put into a special area category. Yeah, I only mention that because I have, and it's rare, I have had very uh, patients with very intractable intergluteal psoriasis, especially perianal, and uh, topicals won't relieve it. So I've used systemic therapies. So um, I would just consider inverse psoriasis kind of like uh, a cousin of genital psoriasis, and therefore uh, it should fall into that category of special areas. Yeah, I agree.